Hi, this is Brooke, and I need to make a clarifying statement. There are three paid sponsors within this episode. Their placement is dictated to me by our current system. At the end of the episode, there are two podcast trailers for individual podcasts. Neither one of those are paid sponsors. It's just me trying to connect you to great material. Thank you for listening. The trial of Richard Nicholas began on June 6th, 1997, almost a year after he was charged with the murder of his two-year-old daughter, Asia. This episode is the presentation of the prosecution's case in that trial. I'm Brooke, and this is episode five of Convicted. Today, we're gonna talk about the evidence in the trial against Richard Nicholas the prosecution's case, in which it was their duty to prove that a man with the legal presumption of innocence was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. After the previous day of jury selection and opening statements, 12 jurors, five attorneys, and one defendant sat before the court. It could almost be described as a machine, a machine in which each part needed to perform its specific function in order to accomplish a common goal, reaching a unanimous verdict. I asked Richard what it was like for him sitting there at the trial. I'm scared as hell. It's, 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 it's all of the uh, testimony I didn't want to hear. I didn't want to see the uh, pictures that they published. I didn't want to be there. Um, 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 there were, you know, times wh where if I could have hid, I would have. But it's, 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 Christina said, you know, as soon as you uh, show emotion or if you act out, that's when you are going to lose this trial. So, so I tried to be, I guess, Stoic, but it's 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 that was the second scariest moment in my whole life, and the first scariest moment was seeing uh, Asia in that car, and, and you know not being able to help. It, it, it's 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 uh, hard to explain, but it's it was you know. Very, very rough. It was hard. Judge Hubbard explained this phase of the trial to the jury as, quote, the actual production of the evidence. She explained that evidence comes in three forms, stipulations, exhibits, and witnesses. But what does that really mean? Uh, stipulations is stipulation between the parties that something is true or exists. The court would then instruct the jury that since the parties agree, that they should accept it. The judge gave the example that you don't need to have a meteorologist come in to say it's a sunny day because that fact isn't being disputed. The judge explains that exhibits are the tangibles. Exhibits are evidence that the jury should consider. They can give it as much weight as they want, such okay. as photographs, such as if a gun were required, uh, recovered or uh, uh, if clothing with blood on it is found or whatever. So like that, stuff. Yeah, they should. It's the tangible evidence. They should give it as much weight as they believe it deserves. Then Judge Hubbard goes on to talk about the witness testimony. Witnesses are persons who testify. And uh, again, the jury has to determine the credibility of the witnesses. They should use their common sense to decide whether the witness is telling the whole truth, not, not the truth, or a partial. So, with everything in place, the presentation of the state's case begins after our first sponsor. I have a friend that's been really stressed out. She's planning her wedding and she's trying to juggle a lot of things. I'm so glad I was able to help by suggesting that she register with Zola. It's perfect. I mean, it's one site that serves all the needs of couples. Zola lets couples register for brands they want. 
It's an easy to use platform and everything can be personalized by notes and photos. And using Zola, the couples can register for whatever they want, sheets, a wine subscription, or honeymoon funds. Zola works directly with over 450 brands. That's a lot. Some other benefits of Zola include that it's available everywhere. You just have to pull out your phone. It has an awesome group gifting option where people all pitch in for a larger gift. And one of my favorites is that Zola helps you with the thank yous. It lets you export a list of the gifts and who sent them. Zola is the wedding registry that will do anything for love. All the gifts, experiences, and funds you want all in one place. Listeners, receive $50 when you register and use Zola. Visit Zola.com slash convicted for details. That's Zola, Z-O-L-A dot com slash convicted. One more time, Zola.com slash convicted. I'm going to do a lot of talking in this episode because as you might remember from the previous episode, the prosecution declined to provide its insights. However, I have just recently, as in yesterday, discovered that Sharon May did provide comments for the Netflix documentary called The Keepers. So if you'd like to see or hear what her voice sounds like, you might want to check that out. We all know what motive or motivation is. It's the reason that someone does something or not. But I wanted to understand how identifying a motive is beneficial to the prosecution's case. It's my understanding that the prosecution in this case stated that the motive was Richard not wanting the financial obligations that came with having a child. In order to prove that he was, in fact, the person who murdered Asia, it's my understanding that the state would need to have a theory of how this crime was carried out. And because the prosecutor was not available to discuss this with me, I chatted with Rachel, who prior to her current position as a post-conviction attorney, served 11 years as a prosecutor. I asked her what felt like a very basic question. Does the prosecution have to present a theory? Well, it, I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by have to. I mean, this the Let's put it this way. If the state does not have a theory, then the state's probably not going to win its case. Always, the prosecution is going to have a theory as to how the crime happened, you know, and and the theory is going to come from the evidence that's offered, you know, the physical evidence, the witness testimony. They're going to have a theory, and they're going to lay out that theory, usually an opening statement. I mean, always. They're going to lay out their theory to some degree in opening statement. Then they're going to offer their witnesses to prove that theory, support that theory. And then they're going to tie it all up at the end in closing. So I I guess the answer is yes. I mean, there's no way to not have a theory, provided that there's at least one witness to testify for the state that becomes its theory. And if, you know, in a complicated case, the theory is dependent on the testimony of multiple witnesses and multiple pieces of physical evidence. But even with one witness, you know, yeah, the state has a theory. Because the state never shared their theory outright for whatever reason, I asked Rachel if she could help me explain what the state's theory of the crime was in this case, as presented through the evidence. The theory was that Richard picked Asia up from her mother's house and was going to take her to the movie theater. And the state would have the jury believe that he intended to use this night to murder her and that he needed to create an alibi. So he went into the movie theater at the Golden Ring Mall and he made sure that he and Asia were seen. They took a picture in the photo booth before the movie, and that was for the purpose, according to the state, of establishing that he and Asia were inside the movie theater or inside the mall at that time. And after taking the photo in the photo booth, 
the state's theory was that Richard went back out to the parking lot, killed Asia in the car, left her in the car, and then established himself further an alibi by going in and seeing the 8 p.m. showing of the movie. And thereafter, when the movie was over, went back to the car, drove the car to Bully's Lane, parked it on the wrong side of the road, ran up to the Texaco station, and had the the guy behind the counter call 911 um, because he was, um, at that point, making up a story that on the way back home from the movie theater, he'd been followed by a road rage driver. Um, and so the state's theory was that that was, you know, completely made up and that, in fact, he had killed her in the parking lot of the movie theater two hours earlier. Up until this point, I've introduced everything in this story chronologically. But the trial is different because every piece of evidence matters. Every witness matters. Every question matters. But me reciting a transcript that's over 2,000 pages would be both inappropriate and really just a bad idea. So this is what I've done. I've divided it into the arguments and theories and then shared the supporting evidence backing those up. In this episode, for the prosecution, and for the next episode, the defense. During this section, I've asked my friend TJ to help break up my voice a little bit when quoting various witnesses. So here it is, the prosecution's evidence against Mr. Nicholas. Mr. Nicholas was apparently a bad man. He had no sense of responsibility or determination of right and wrong. The evidence proving this included Asia's mother's testimony that he had failed to pay child support. She had to take him to court in order to get support for Asia. During this process, Richard had the audacity to request a paternity test, even though there had been no prior dispute that Asia was his daughter. When the test came back positive, he signed a voluntary waiver to have child support money, including the back payments, taken from his paycheck. However, even with that agreement in place, he still defaulted on child support. At best, his child support payments were inconsistent. And on top of that, he didn't have the required medical insurance policy on Asia as ordered by the court. What he did have on Asia, not required by anyone, was a life insurance policy the Gerber Grow Up Plan. He originally ordered the Gerber Grow Up Plan for Asia on May 11, 1995. And in that plan, he had identified himself as the sole beneficiary. After two months, this plan was canceled and therefore no longer valid. A second Gerber Grow Up Plan was taken out on Asia Nicholas on March 3, 1996. And to be perfectly honest, it's still unclear who the beneficiary or beneficiaries were of that second policy. Richard Nicholas was a gun collector. He went to shooting ranges. He knew about and owned more than one gun. Detective Gordon testified that when they searched his apartment, law enforcement found two registered weapons and corresponding ammunition. Neither gun was the type of weapon that had been used in the murder. Because the state's theory of the crime was that Mr. Nicholas had murdered Asia prior to the movie, then attended the movie alone, they had to address the issue of the picture in the photo booth. They did this by inferring that the picture could have been taken at the 701 time. The photo booth technician testified that the type of picture that Richard and Asia had taken was only printed at 7.01 or 7.43. Therefore, if the picture was taken at 7.01, it could have given Mr. Nicholas enough time to return Asia to the car, shoot her, leave her in the parking lot, and then return to see Pinocchio alone by 8 p.m. Also, in assisting with the cooperation of this story, a teenage movie theater employee was called to the stand as a witness. 
He testified that he saw someone who looked like Mr. Nicholas. That person also reminded him of someone he played basketball with at the theater. He couldn't remember if this individual was with a little girl or not. The teenage witness did not state that it was, in fact, Mr. Nicholas, nor did he point him out or identify him in the courtroom. It's time for a break from our second sponsor. I've asked Blake to help me because I know he's such a big fan. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone, and it's really the easiest way I've found to shop for tickets. I can be anywhere, like a closet, and with just a few taps, I instantly find seats. I actually just found some tickets a few minutes ago to the Delicate Boys show in Austin this Friday night, Cheer Up Charlie's, if any y'all are around. The SeatGeek app is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever. It saves you time and money by searching multiple ticket sites to compare prices and find amazing deals. And to make sure you get the best value, SeatGeek grades every ticket to help you find the best seats that fit your budget. Every SeatGeek purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets with confidence. Make SeatGeek your go-to app for finding the best deals on every type of ticket, from sports and concerts to comedy and theater. Best of all, our listeners get $20 off their SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code CONVICTED today. That's promo code CONVICTED for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. The gas station attendant testified that Mr. Nicholas's, quote, energy was not quite there, unquote, which I interpret as meaning he was calm. But then he also stated that he was sweating and out of breath. He even mentioned, though it was objected to and sustained, that Mr. Nicholas was acting like he was, quote, schizophrenic. And he said that one point he laid his torso on the counter in distress. After testifying that he didn't listen to the phone call Mr. Nicholas was having with the 911 operator, the gas station attendant testified that Mr. Nicholas had told him originally that, quote, a black guy had shot his daughter. But then he told the 911 operator that it was a white guy. I'm going to interject here for just a second because I have information that was not provided at the trial. I read the original interview with the gas station attendant on the night of the murder. During his interview with the police, there was no mention of Mr. Nicholas declaring the race of the shooter. We need to take another detour at this point and talk about juror number 10. After the second day of the trial, a concern was brought to the court about juror number 10. It seems she had misinformed the court during the voir dire process of her relationship with a person, her daughter, working in law enforcement. When questioned about this, juror number 10 stated that her daughter was just a state's attorney and she had just started in January. Juror number 10 was dismissed for cause and the jury now consisted of 12 jurors and one alternate. Officer Hannah, who you might remember, was the first law enforcement officer to respond to the crime scene. He testified that it had taken him, quote, a matter of seconds, I guess maybe between 15 and 25 seconds, unquote, to get to the gas station after the 911 call had been placed. The phone call itself lasted between two to four minutes. According to my math, that puts him there before Mr. Nicholas walked out the door. He testified that he was directed to the scene by Mr. Nicholas, and Officer Hannah asked Mr. Nicholas to help him get Asia out of the car, a 1990 Chevy Cavalier. When he was asked by the prosecutor how Asia was removed from the car, Officer Hannah said, quote, We both reached in and grabbed a hold of her. I believe he unhooked the seatbelt, and we pulled her out. Additionally, Officer Hannah testified that Mr. Nicholas had been unusually calm at the scene, saying, quote, As a parent whose child had been shot, you know, he never cried. He never got hysterical. He didn't, he didn't really get emotional. Kind of quiet, really. He basically stayed behind me the whole time. From the time I got out of my car. From the time we got out. 
from the time we went up to the vehicle. You know, he just was following me around, basically. Unquote. Furthermore, everyone who the state called to ask their opinion about Mr. Nicholas's reaction to his daughter's murder stated that it was abnormal in some way. No mental health professionals were ever called to testify on this matter. Detective Gordon was called to the stand briefly to testify, and during this questioning, he stated that through the use of a canine search team, no weapons or additional evidence was found within a large radius of the scene. He also testified to interviewing Asia's mother that evening and that he was present for the autopsy the following day. I'm going to interrupt the evidence again to talk about the jury and other court happenings. Annoying, isn't it? Now imagine this was happening in real time and you were seated as a jury member and not listening to a podcast with controls to speed things up or skip them all together. This time, we're going to talk about juror number one, potential juror number 72, the foreman. He reported to the court that another juror had brought up specific concerns regarding a member of the audience. Juror number two, along with juror number four, had been conversing with a member of the audience and his wife. These audience members had also been identified as making distracting gestures to the jury. After a long conversation, it was decided that the man and his wife would be questioned as to their intentions communicating with the members of the jury. The man was asked by the judge if he was in fact gesturing to the jury, and he said, quote, yes. The only reason that I looked at the jury and did like that was because three of them was sleeping at the same time. So I tried to get their attention so they can wake up, unquote. It was also discovered that the man knew juror number two and juror number four from activities outside the courtroom. The judge informed the audience member that it was not his place to police the behavior of the jury and told him to make no further contact with the jury and to take a seat. At this point, Ms. Gutierrez requested that the man and his wife be removed from the trial. She also asked that jurors number two and four be removed from the jury for cause because of the potential contamination. The judge asked the audience member and his wife to abstain from attending the rest of the trial, but no jurors were removed and the trial continued. I wanted to know if a sleeping juror is a common thing. So I asked Rachel, is this a thing that happens frequently? There was mention of the fact that some of the jurors were nodding off during bench conferences. And that is particularly common when there are these extended breaks where the jury is not engaged in the trial because the judge is you know, talking to the lawyers up at the bench for a long period of time, and it can be incredibly boring. And then other times you can see jurors sleeping or nodding off or dozing or closing their eyes, not necessarily asleep during, you know, like the boring parts of the trial. Not all parts of the trial are, are captivating. There are parts that are, you know, very dry where the state is required to, you know, kind of go through all of their the evidence collection at the scene and the photographs and, you know, not everything is exciting. So yeah, it's pretty common that, I mean, maybe not that three jurors at the same time are going to be seen as sleeping, but certainly, a, you know, one juror here and there happens. Yep. I can see jurors sleeping through a bench conference, not being such a terrible thing, but what about not just one? but three jurors sleeping through an evidentiary part of a trial. Doesn't it seem like that would make the jury somewhat ineffective? I wanted to know what the procedure for dealing with that might be. Ordinarily, you know, if a juror is sleeping, you would think that either the judge is going to notice it or one of the lawyers is going to notice it or the defendant himself is going to notice it. I've never heard of a sleeping juror 
be called to the attention of the court by a spectator. And, you know, it's, it's possible that the spectator would have the vantage point of seeing something that none of the other participants in the trial happened to notice. But I guess regardless of who sees it and how it gets to the attention of the judge, you know, the, the judge has to make the decision whether or not the information seems credible. So, for instance, if a courtroom spectator said three of the jurors are sleeping, but the judge has had her eye on the jury the entire time and she knows that that is not the case, then maybe she doesn't have to take the steps that she would have to take if she hadn't been looking at the jury box and, you know, she'd been taking notes instead then maybe she would want to explore the allegation that some of the jurors were sleeping. And that would generally consist of bringing it to the attention of both lawyers and the defendant and seeing what everybody thought, because usually the judge wants the input of both sides before taking any action. And that would, you know, you would expect it to lead to bringing that juror up for questioning. But there's, a lot of considerations that go into that. So it's a, you know, it's kind of a fact intensive inquiry. It's a discretionary decision with the judge, how to approach it. In any given case, the judge may say, okay, thank you for that information, Mr. Spectator. I'm going to keep an eye on it. You know, may not want to disrupt the trial, may not want to embarrass the juror at that moment, but We'll just sort of keep an eye on it, make sure it doesn't continue. In any particular case, the judge decides, oh, that's pretty concerning. Three of the jury members were sleeping. Try to get more information about which jurors were supposedly sleeping and then bring them up individually and question them. But I would think that if a spectator says that three jury members are sleeping, that the judge should look at that pretty carefully and make sure that three jurors, you know, had not missed significant parts of the evidence. In this case, after reading the transcripts, it was my impression that the sleeping juror issue was not the one that was addressed. The, the issue of the relationship between the spectator and the jurors that he was gesturing to that that's potentially a concern like of contamination and potential somebody in the courtroom being exposed to information that the jury itself was not exposed to and then maybe contaminating the jurors that seemed to be the focus of everybody and nobody focused on the fact that it was said multiple times by this guy that three jurors were nodding off. And he did make a point of saying they were sleeping. Yes, they were sleeping during a bench conference when you all were up there talking. But when the judge sort of pushed him on that, he said, but they had been sleeping already, even before that started, which by definition means that they had been sleeping during an active part of the trial, which is a red flag and and perhaps should have been looked into, whether it was brought up by either the attorneys or, you know, by the judge herself, but it wasn't. We're going to take a short break for our last sponsor. The people who work at my local post office are really nice, even though they deal with so many people who've been standing in line for such a long time. Plus, the road to my local post office is completely closed off. So what was once a short trip is now a very long excursion. I'm so thankful that I have stamps.com because anything I would need to do at the post office over the river and through the woods, I can instead do right from my desk. And unlike the post office, it never closes. So I can buy and print official U.S. postage whenever I need it. I use stamps.com pretty much every day. I could be sending letters to Richard or CD to Blake or questions to Rachel. And stamps.com is always there to help me save time. It could help you save time too. Right now, use the name Convicted for this special offer. It's a four-week trial that includes postage and a digital scale. Don't wait. 
Go to stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the radio microphone at the top of the homepage and type in convicted. That's stamps.com. Enter convicted. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. The question of gunshot residue, also known as GSR, has been on the mind of listeners since the beginning. So let's talk about it. I wasn't familiar with GSR before this case, and so I did some research on it so I could have a better understanding of what was being said by the experts. It boils down to this. GSR are particles that are expelled by a gun and deposited on a person's clothes, skin, and really whatever happens to be nearby when the gun is fired. Thousands of particles are expelled with every shot, and according to the Crime Scene Training website, when a person has 2,000 or more particles on their hands, face, or really anywhere on their body, evidence points to the fact that they've shot a gun. If a person has a positive result for 20 or less particles, it's most likely that they were transferred from another source. There's different types of particles and different types of tests, so let's talk about it in terms of this case. Technician Rumber was in charge of the mobile crime scene unit, and he was the witness that testified to the facts that I'm about to share with you. He had been with the Baltimore City Crime Lab for seven years at the time of his testimony, and he testified that his job was to, quote, Respond to crime scenes, take photographs, collect physical evidence, and recover any evidence that may be there. It was established that the car window on Asia's side had been rolled down all but two inches. He went over a series of tragic and detailed photos of the victim who, when he arrived, was laying on the ground next to the car. He identified that she'd been shot through the left eye, and when they rolled the body on the side, there was a partial exit of the bullet from the back of her head. When asked how the gunshot residue test is conducted, Technician Rumber said this. We perform our collection process by using a gunshot primer residue collection kit. It's a kit about the size of a large envelope sealed in a plastic bag. We take it out of the plastic bag, and inside of the plastic bag is a small envelope. It's an envelope, and we take the envelope, and inside the envelope, there's a Ziploc bag, which contains the two sampling pieces. From that, we take the two pieces, which are in a protective covering. We take the pieces that we use to collect with. They're adhesive, and we take the adhesive dabbers, which they're called, and we dab from the index finger to around the web of the, around the, web of the hand down to the end of the thumb, approximately 100 times. So basically, some sterile round pieces of paper with special adhesive on the back are dabbed on a person's skin multiple times and then sealed into a sterile bag. The test on Mr. Nicholas was performed by crime lab technician John French. Daniel Van Gelder, criminalist in Baltimore City, was called to the stand to share the results of the GSR testing. And here they are, quote, Gunshot primer residue were found on the left hand on the left-hand sampler from Richard Nicholas. Gunshot primer residues were not found on the right-hand sampling device from Richard Nicholas. So, there were gunshot residue particles found on Richard Nicholas's left hand. Not his dominant hand, but yet, there they were. Mr. Van Gelder asked to refer to his notes when he was questioned about the number of particles that were found on Mr. Nicholas's hand. Daniel Van Gelder, the gunshot residue expert, stated that there were 10, 10 particles of GSR on Mr. Nicholas's left hand. There's another type of science of extreme importance in this case. It was later called the linchpin to the conviction and emphasized in the closing argument by the state. The type of science I'm referring to is called lividity. I'm going to give a simple explanation on lividity, but it's my hope to have an expert in the area explain more about this type of science on a future episode. According to the Explore Forensics website, lividity is basically what gravity does with the blood inside of a body when the heart's no longer pumping. 
the blood goes to the lowest point of the body. So if a body's been lying on its side, the blood will have taken gravity's lead and also settled on the side. On the body, lividity presents as a dark purple area and can start to form within 30 minutes of when the heart stops working. Lividity can change positions when a body is moved, but it becomes fully fixed at about six hours. And at that point, it's not able to be altered. According to the law enforcement section of encyclopedia.com, lividity is too variable to be an accurate indicator of the time of death. The person called to testify about the issue of lividity was Dr. Dennis Shute, C-H-U-T-E. Dr. Shute was not only the medical examiner for Baltimore, but also a forensic pathologist, which according to his testimony and credentials, qualified him to investigate and determine the cause of death in various cases. He performed the autopsy on Asia Nicholas. He talked about the path of the bullet, stating that it simply went from front to back, entering near her left eye and exiting at the same level from the back of the head, suggesting that the gun was not pointed upwards or downwards, but rather straight towards her face. When he was asked to define lividity, he stated that it's, quote, the settling of blood into the skin and dependent areas of the body due to gravity after death. He was then asked to read a statement from the autopsy report on Asia Nicholas in regards to lividity. That statement was, quote, Lividity was present and fixed on the left lateral and posterior surfaces of the body, except in the areas exposed to pressure. When asked to explain this statement, he said, When we examined the body, it was present on the left side of the body and also on the back of the body except for where the skin was in contact with the surface that it was lying on. In those areas, there was no lividity seen at all. The prosecutor then asked Dr. Shute that if the victim had been slumped on her left side in a car and then placed on her back until the autopsy was performed, how long would it have taken for the lividity to fix on that left side? Two hours, two hours or more. He said. The amount of time the state had implied Mr. Nicholas had left Asia in the car while he went to Pinocchio on his own. Basically, the state's lividity evidence completely debunked Mr. Nicholas's road rage story. Asia would have already been dead for at least two hours before 911 was called. How do you defend your client against that kind of scientific evidence? You have 60 seconds remaining. I'm going to address a question that I've seen posed to several true crime podcasts lately. And that question is, where is the victim in all of this? And of course, I can only answer for myself. If a person is convicted of a crime because a member of the legal system committed an unethical act, the victim of the crime has been disrespected in the most severe manner possible. Regardless of the defendant's innocence or guilt, If prosecutors or police cut corners or tamper with evidence or lie, the victim can never have justice because the evidence has been distorted. The crime can never be conclusively solved, and that is tragedy, not justice. Questioning the justice system, asking if the rules were followed, is the greatest service you can provide for a victim. I assure you, the investigation process of this podcast has been focused on the justice system and asking if justice was served for Asia Nicholas. That determination can't be made without focusing on the steps that led to her father's conviction. Because what if he didn't do it? What if a two-year-old girl is still waiting for justice? You can see pictures, download the transcripts, and view other documents at convictedpod.com. Convicted is hosted and produced by me, with music and scoring by musical genius Blake Maples. You can see and hear his work at blakemaples.com. So I noticed that in the transcript that the judge told you that whenever your attorneys 
came to the bench that you could go also, and you did. Gosh, every time. I, I don't know what the courtroom looked like because they've been redone since then, but how do they keep the jury from hearing that, hearing what's happening up there? They did. They did. It was a very, very small courtroom, and I'm sure that they heard every single word. What's the podcast? Play me a podcast. Hey guys, it's TJ from the Pints and Puzzles podcast. You miss me to my dad. We explore some of the strange, unusual, and often obscure cases throughout history. But did I mention there's craft beer reviews? My dad shows the best. Come give us a listen on iTunes or your podcast app of choice. They Walk Among Us is a podcast exploring the UK's most sinister and surreal crimes, including the woman who killed the boyfriend as he spent too much time on Facebook, to the teenage boys whose online relationship involves spies, sex, and the near-fatal stabbing of one of them. Subscribe on iTunes or your favourite podcast provider. <laughs>